Um, first of all, I would like to thank Yang Yang for in, for inviting me to give a talk um, in uh, Rensselaer Polytech Institute. Um, so this is a joint work with my student Ren Chao Ma and my co-author uh, Natalajan and Soheli from University of Illinois in Chicago. Uh, in Chicago. So this talk uh, I consider a convex uh, constraint optimization problem. So, uh, so we want to minimize uh, uh, objective function f zero subject to m constraint. Um, excuse me. Let me switch to the full screen version. So there are m constraint. So we have f i less than or equal to zero. We have inequality constraint. Other than that, we also have a set constraint just for modeling convenience. So here, the set constraint is a capital X. So we assume uh, X is convex and closed, and uh, it has a simple structure such that the projection to X can be calculated easily. So for example, X can be the full space, uh, a ball, or a box. And here, we only focus on convex case, so FI, uh, all FI are assumed to be convex, including objective functions and constraint functions. OK. so. Um, so uh, I'm interested in theoretical work. So um, so I didn't consider any specific uh, applications of this model, but uh, I think you believe that the non-constraint optimizations appear everywhere in different areas, including operational research, financial engineering, and uh, data science. Um, nowadays, people use uh, prefer to a lot of people use a subgradient first order method to solve optimization problem. I will also consider a uh, first order master. First order master means uh, uh, the algorithm can only use the gradient or subgradient of constraint or object function. And why people prefer to use the first order master? Because uh, it requires very little uh, lower, relatively lower memory, a smaller memory space, and it has a lower per iteration cost compared to other approach, for example, a second order approach. Um, and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, um, first order master and constraint optimization has been studied for many decades, and uh, there exist so many uh, algorithms based on different ideas. Here is just a very incomplete list of existing work that includes switching gradient, augmented Lagrangian master, which was recently uh, developed and analyzed by uh, Yang Yang, and also primal dual master and penalty master and level set master. And uh, uh, my I question, uh, so the question is that uh, given a constraint convex optimization, what will be the computational complexity to find something called epsilon optimal and epsilon feasible solution? So here is the definition. It means that uh, you have a point in the in the set capital X, and it has uh, uh, it is it violate the constraint at most by epsilon, and it is far away from the optimal value by the objective value is away from the uh, optimal value by at most epsilon. Here, I'm talking about complexity. Then how do you define the complexity? Um, in, in, in first order literature, um, because all algorithms are only using for a gradient, so, we, so basically, uh, you, in this case, you can uh, just measure the complexity of the algorithm by the number of the gradients, uh, either the objective functions gradient or the constraints gradients. You need to calculate it. Uh, in order to find an epsilon optimal, epsilon uh, uh, optimal, uh, feasible solution. Of course, this is based on the first order master assumption. If you are comparing algorithm for like a, with a second order master, then you have to modify the definition here. So then the question is that uh, uh, in, from the theoretical pers uh, perspective, uh, what factor of the problem that determine the, the computational complexity of the algorithm? So there are many uh, factors, many properties, but here I want to emphasize two uh, most important ones. First is, is called error bound condition, which is the focus of this talk. Actually, error bound condition will include strong complexity as a special case. Um, and the uh, uh, smoothness is a second component, second property that influence the complexity. So here we have uh, four pictures. So the, the first pictures, uh, uh, sometimes uh, error bound condition is in the old days is also called a sharpness condition. So basically, if the problem has a good error bound condition, the function curve should look uh, very sharp, which looks like this. It means that uh, let me see if I can draw something here. Um, probably not. Mm, yeah, never mind. So in the first picture here, uh, yeah, I can use uh, uh, 
the mouse. Yes, so you can see uh, if the function is sharp, which means that uh, if the solution uh, is deviated away from optimal solution, the objective function will increase, the function value will increase very quickly. So if the function like this, usually you have a lower complexity. And this is kind of a, in general. Um, so then the second second picture here, uh, let, this one has a has a bad error, error bound condition, or it has no error bound condition. The function looks very flat. Basically it means that if the solution, uh, even when the solution is very far away from the optimal set, the object function will only increase a little bit. So the, why this is difficult, first of all, the one intuition is that the gradient is very small. So your solution will change very little uh, from iteration to iteration. Second, uh, in a lot of optimization algorithms, we try to minimize the objective gap. But if the function is very flat, even when the object function is gap is small, your solution may still have a very low quality because it's very far away from the optimal solution. OK, so let's some uh, intuitions about why error bounds can influence the complexity. And smoothness, I think everybody should, uh, uh, knows that uh, smooth means basically means differentiability. And if the function is smooth like this, you have a lower complexity. But if it's non-smooth in general, you will, have a, you will have a higher complexity. OK, so um, the, the method I use to solve the constraint problem is called a level set method. It is not a very uh, a new method. Actually, people in 1995 have already uh, studied this. Uh, but recently, I become more interested in this because it has a nice geometric interpretation. And you can also achieve um, the same complexity as the, the best result in literature. So that's why I like this approach. Um, so I kind of revisit that and try to uh, make it revival. revival. Um, and here, uh, uh, this is the, the so-called level set function. And uh, it is defined as the min-max structure. So uh, here, it is minimization of this PRX function. And R is called a level, level parameter. And the P is defined as the maximum of the constraint function and the objective function minus the level parameter. OK? Um, so it's kind of an integration of uh, suboptimality and the uh, infeasibility so that you want to minimize PRX. OK, so uh, if uh, uh, under the capacity assumption, this function HR, I call it a level function, a level set function, it, it is always non-increasing non and a convex in R. Basically, it will look like the, the curve you see in this picture. And it's greater than 0 if R is less than F star. F star is the optimal value of the constraint optimization problem. If R is exactly F star, then HR is 0. If R is, is bigger than F star, then HR is less than equal to zero, and it will be strictly less than zero if uh, there exists a strictly feasible solution. And another information we need uh, is, is that uh, it is always less than equal to F star minus R when R is less than equal to F star. In this case, I mean, the HR curve is always below the this red straight line, okay? With a 45 degree angle. So, and the, here is the level set master uh, in general. So you can generate a sequence, basic idea is that uh, you begin with a lower estimation of F star, which we call F R zero. Then you generate a sequence of a level parameter, R1, R2, R0, uh, R1, R2, and so on, such that they converge to F star from below. Um, so here is the, the idea. So here we, we have to choose the step size parameter alpha. And uh, you have the uh, target the epsilon uh, precisions, and uh, you will have uh, uh, initial value r less than f star. Then you keep running this algorithm. And here the requirement is that in each iteration, you need to you need to find a solution x k such that this p function multiply r is less than equal to f star minus r k. If that's the case, you update your level parameter r k to r k plus one by adding adding alpha p. And because of this inequality, you see here. Uh, RK plus one is still less than or equal to F star. Let, let me basically make sure this sequence is always uh, less than or equal to F star, which is important property we need. Of course, this is just like a prototype algorithm. Uh, there is a lot of detail you, 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 want to, you want to know. So first of all, uh, when we are going to stop, we stop if we know that F star minus RK is less than or equal to alpha, uh, epsilon. And uh, uh, of course, you need to know F star, but suppose we know F star, and what does this condition help us? Suppose uh, this condition holds, it basically tells you that 
P is less than equal to epsilon because of the inequality here in line three. Therefore, and Px f star will be less than equal to epsilon because um, P is actually uh, non-increasing in R. Non-increasing in R. And uh, um, so we can increase uh, R to f star, so it's less than equal to epsilon. You, you get it's something even smaller, so it's less than equal to epsilon. And if you plug in a definition of a P, you end up with this inequality. This inequality is very interesting. It tells us that xk is epsilon feasible and epsilon suboptimal. So therefore, we can say xk will be a good solution. That's why we need this inequality uh, to, to generate uh, rk, and that's why we stop when this inequality holds. OK, so next. Um, oh, by the way, can everybody see the, the arrows uh, in the screen? Yes. OK, good. Yeah, otherwise, uh, you don't know where I'm pointing to. Um, so and then here is a geometric interpretation of the level set method. Suppose we can solve the, the uh, suppose we can find xk such that this inequality holds. Then basically, we are going to have an arrow like this length, and it's no longer, it does not exceed this uh, uh, red line. Okay. And what happened is that r1 equals to r0 plus this arrow, length of this arrow. Then we move on to a new level, r, r1. Then we start to calculate the xk again, such that we end up with this value, and move on, and move on, and so on. As you can see in this procedure, I want from R1 to R2 to R3, and the whole sequence converge to F star. And according to my inequality here, if they are close enough, then you guarantee XK will be epsilon optimal and epsilon feasible. Okay, then you must have questions. Uh, it sounds good, but how? Oh, sorry, then there is a, a theory. Uh, suppose this algorithm can be implemented, uh, in, then you guarantee RK is always to the left of F star. And you also guarantee to find epsilon optimal, epsilon feasible solution within this many outer iterations. Uh, iterations. And uh, here we have a theta parameter, which is basically uh, the negative of this quantity, this minimization quantity. So this minimization, the value of this minimization is essentially the so-called left, uh, left derivative of a function h at point f star. So geometrically, is a theta is basically the tangent of alpha. Alpha is the angle uh, from x-axis to the second, the lower red line you see here. Okay, so this is somehow the condition number that determine how efficient the level set method is. Okay, then let's talk about the implementation detail. First of all, how do you guarantee this one holds? Uh, this inequality, to check this inequality, you need to know f star, but we don't know f star. So the solution is that we actually ensure a stronger condition. We, we want to make sure alpha p is less than equal to hr. And we already know hr is below f, mi f star minus r according to this picture. So that's why we just ensure a stronger condition. Then how do we ensure this stronger condition? Then we just need to approximately solve the following min max problem by the definition of hr. Just minimize p given rk. And uh, because uh, uh, alpha is less than one, right? And if a P is closer enough to H, alpha P will be less than equal to H. So that's the idea. So and depending on the smoothness of the problem, we can use a different approach to solve this sub-problem in order to achieve this uh, inequality. Uh, by the way, this inequality, you can view it as a uh, kind of a relative accuracy in, of alpha. So we know that in optimization, we have an epsilon accuracy, which is always mostly uh, absolute accuracy. So this is a relative accuracy of level alpha. But alpha is not as small as uh, epsilon. In implementation, alpha is something like 0 0.5, 0 0.7. Okay, so, and if it's non-smooth, uh, we just use a standard subgradient descent to solve that, which is easy. Just calculate a subgradient C and project it to, uh, to uh, capital X, and that's it. If it's a, uh, F is a smooth, and, but even f is smooth, px is still non-smooth due to the max function here. But we just use a, a smoothing uh, accelerated gradient method. We replace the px by uh, something called exponential smoothing with a smooth parameter sigma. If sigma is very large, then this will uh, uh, be very close to the max function. Okay, so then this function is smooth, then we can use an accelerated gradient method by Nesro, for example, to solve it. So now we know how to solve the sub-problem to get a P, and then we can update our solution. Then we, that's how we implement level semester. So here is the, the existing result about the complexity. 
So here in the table, I summarize four algorithms. Uh, switching gradient, primal dual, augmented, augmented Lagrangian, and level set master. We categorize them in four different cases according to convexity or strong convexity, and also smoothness or non-smoothness. Okay, so then we have this uh, result. Uh, by the way, if you see the uh, empty uh, field in this table, uh, you're going to see something like this also in other table I'm going to show you later. If that's the case, that means uh, either means this algorithm so complexity is unknown in this in this case, or uh, this algorithm cannot be applied in this case. Uh, in Yang Yang's paper, for example, you know, for in this augmented Lagrangian masters, uh, I think he focused on smooth problems, so that's why there's no result for non-smooth case. Um, so here is the, the existing result. Actually, uh, the question is that can we do better uh, under additional assumption? Uh, actually, if we allow any additional assumptions, you cannot do better in, in, uh, uh, than, for example, the, the lead level set master in each of these four cases, because this complexity is known to be the optimal one. For example, in a strongly convex smooth case, the optimal complexity will be one over square root epsilon, which is approved rigorously by, um, rigorously by uh, Yang Yang and uh, uh, Ouyang. And this result um, uh, it sounds a little bit negative, so we can do any, cannot do anything anymore. But if you are, if it, for some problem, it has some nice structures, you can still do something better than this. And what will be the structure we are looking for? To get a better uh, complexity, and of course, we don't want this assumption or this structure to be very unique to some problem. We want it still want it to be general enough to cover a large class of a problem, right? And actually, the, the condition, the structure uh, I'm looking into is uh, uh, is a uh, error bound condition. So uh, this is the problem I want to solve. I want to remind you again. Um, wait a moment. There is a bar. Going down, uh, maybe it's okay. Uh, okay, it goes up. Okay, so here is the error bound condition. I'm assuming uh, I said uh, so. This is the error bound condition. Here, g is something called a growth rate. D is just an expo exponent. So this is in what you said. Uh, a capital X star here is the set of optimal solution. This is in what you says if your solution is far away from optimal set. How will the g function increase? Here, g function uh, is defined with the optimal objective value f star. Okay, um, so um, maybe I will. Uh, here are some some um, a class of problems that satisfy uh, error bound condition. For example, if f i are non smooth by the piecewise linear, and actually this condition holds with d being one, and if the problem is strongly convex. Then this inequality holds with a d being two. Uh, that's why I, uh, in the previous slides, I said this, uh, um, in this context, uh, strong convexity is a special case uh, of error bound condition. And if the problem is uh, the function are semi algebraic, then the d here will depend on the degree of the polynomial defining a least f. So d somehow can be calculated if you know the, the trust structure of the problem by the g, capital G here is usually unknown. Okay, so given uh, this inequality, this error bound condition has been studied for uh, uh, for many years. It has a very long history. The, the first result we know for error bound condition is given by Hoffman, the well known Hoffman inequality. And also, Lee has been introduced to uh, analyze inequality system and optimization problem. And uh, uh, I think uh, because of the limit of the time, I won't be able to uh, give a a quick review about the, the history. And also, I know that uh, the papers I listed here are just a very small portion of the existing work in this direction. So I know this video will be recorded. So if you are watching this in YouTube and realize your paper is not here, I'm sorry for that. And uh, here, I just want to mention the little connections between the error bound condition of inequality system and error bound condition of optimization problem. So, uh, so suppose you have an inequality system, uh, let's say convex inequality system. There are uh, inequalities G1, G0 to Gm, less than equal to zero. And suppose your goal is to find a feasible solution, the solution is let's satisfy all of these inequality. Then the error bound condition is written in this way. So the left hand side is how far you are away from the feasible set. The right hand side is how much you violate the inequalities, right? You see, so then, if you look at the optimization problem, the optimal set is essentially all solution X whose objective function, objective value 
is less than equal to the optimal value, and it is also feasible. If it's feasible, if the solution is feasible and optimal value is lower than less than equal to F star, then it has to be optimal solution. So then if you compare these two, then you can realize, okay, the error bound condition I just write uh, uh, in the previous slides is essentially this inequality. The right hand side here is basically GP with uh, 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 MP is defined with F star. Okay, so let's sound connection. It's easy to understand. Any questions? Okay, so let, let's move on. Uh, actually, error bound condition uh, has been introduced to analyze the complexity for showing unconstrained convex optimization. In unconstrained case, uh, fi are all zero from i, well, i from, for, for i from one to m. And the, therefore, p function here will only have f zero minus f star without f one to f m. So that's why the right hand side is reduced to this one. Okay, so let's see how uh, error bound condition can reduce the complexity. So because the picture, uh, sorry, the table is too large, I have to use ns to represent non-smooth and to represent, I'm sorry, there's a typo, s to represent smooth and sc to represent strongly convex. So we still have a different condition and strongly convex is again, essentially the, the case of error bound with d being two. So you can compare this complexity people obtain here um, the algorithm, the best algorithm in an unconstrained case that utilize error bound condition is uh, developed by a Renegar and a Grimmer, and it is called a restarted subgradient master. And this is the paper that motivates our work. And you can see in this case, um, suppose D is one. If the, the function are like a piecewise linear, for example, the complexity under error bound condition, even for a non-smooth problem, will become logarithmic. Has, it depends on epsilon uh, in a logarithmic way. So this is a very low complexity. However, if you, you don't, if you don't utilize error bound condition and you have a non-smooth piecewise linear function to minimize, then you are going to, in this category, non-smooth convex case. And your complexity is actually very bad, one over epsilon squared. Okay, and another comparison is here. Uh, I think, uh, let me see. Um, if the function is non-smooth, and uh, uh, here, sorry, if the function is smooth, but you do not utilize error bound condition, and there's no strong complexities, then what you have is one over square root epsilon. However, if you use error bound condition, you get a one over square root epsilon, not square root, a little bit, uh, with a degree a little bit lower than uh, 0 0.5. You have a 0 0.5 minus one over d. So as long as D is something like a, a little bit uh, positive, then this will be at least better than one over square root epsilon. Okay. And by the way, uh, error, error bound condition for the unconstrained problem in a smooth case, the D has to be always greater to zero. Otherwise you can derive some contradiction unless the domain uh, X is bounded. So that's why I put this inequality here. Okay, this is, shows us something promising because the error bound condition can use to accelerate first order master um, but uh, there's no study for constraint case yet. There are a lot of work for unconstrained problem, but there's very little study for error bound condition under constraint uh, optimization case. So let's let motivate our algorithm idea research. Can we make a, a level set master faster in error bound condition? Um, so, um, so the first try we, we can do is the following. Remember previously I said I cannot guarantee this inequality because F star is unknown. That's why I switched to a stronger condition. I said alpha p less than equal to h, and I know h is less than equal to f star minus r. Uh, so here, if we want to get some acceleration, we have to do something more challenging. We try to enforce this inequality, alpha p less than equal to f star minus r, rather than this one. So how do we do this? So we still use a subgradient method. So I'm, I'm going to focus on the non-smooth case. I will briefly mention smooth case because the idea is very similar. So then how do we solve the sub problem such that we can find an X satisfy this inequality without knowing F star? So we, uh, under error bound condition, it turns out that I can prove the following theory proposition. Uh, assumption one is essentially convex assumption, nothing special. Assumption two is error bound condition. Suppose F are now smooth by the gradient are bounded by M. If you choose this step size, which is called a polyar step size, 
uh, if I remember the term correctly, then if you use this step size in subgradient method with alpha and B chosen in this method with this inequality holes, then it guarantees that uh, the objective value of this subproblem will be reduced by a factor of B if the initial solution does not satisfy the inequality we want. And this, will, this uh, B factor reduction will happen in T iterations with T defined in this way. So it looks complicated, but briefly speaking is that if you use this special uh, step size and your initial solution is very bad, you will guarantee the objective value will be reduced by B, for example, 80% after a fixed number of iterations. So that's uh, the key observation. Okay, so then how do we use this result? Can I have a question here? Yes, please. Yeah, so, so yes. this proposition, do you need uh, to know uh, the constant G and D right, in your error bound condition? Uh, no, so that's a good question. Actually, that's uh, something I'm going to discuss, but uh, uh, in the context of this proposition one itself, we do not need to know a G and D because here we haven't talked about the algorithm yet. So uh, we haven't talked about the, 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 uh, what or how to implement the algorithm. Actually, we already mentioned something here. We said that the step size eta should be given in this form, but eta doesn't depend on G and D. Right. Actually, eta right. can be perfectly calculated. It depends on objective function, and B and alpha are user determining a control parameter. It works for any combination of alpha and beta, as long alpha and B, as long as they satisfy this inequality. Because C is the gradient known, you can also calculate it. So with this calculable uh, eta, you have this guarantee. But the T is not computable. Okay. T evolved okay. G and the D. So we don't know how many iterations we need to run, but we know that uh, if the solution is bad, no more than this many iterations, I will observe a reduction by factor B. And this, uh, this event can be calculated, can be detected, because um, PZI and PZ0 can be calculated. Okay. And the B is a U true. Okay. You can check this. I see. I see. Okay. So, yeah. Now, uh, how do we use this result, though? And uh, of course, you can come up with something we studied a uh, subgradient method RSG. And uh, the, uh, this idea is the very simple. You run this algorithm, okay, uh, with uh, either condition A or B, check if condition A or B happen. Uh, which one happened first? If A happened first, then you reduce objective value. Um, then you don't know if this inequality is satisfied or not because it only says if it doesn't satisfy, it will reduce. But it doesn't say if it reduce, this inequality is not satisfied. So you don't know. So, but it's, it's okay because uh, if something is reduced by a factor geometrically, this event will not happen too many times. But eventually it won't happen anymore. So A will not happen too many times. So if A happens, we will restart, start separating the descent master and a new solution and go back to one. And if B happens, B is that in number iteration, uh, reach T. For this moment, let's just assume T is computable. Okay, so if it, we, can, we can check the condition number of iteration and see if it exceeds T, T, T or not. If it exceeds T, which means B happens first, and we have if B happens and we haven't seen the the reduction of the objective value, then uh, it means that uh, alpha p must, must alpha p zero p, p z zero must be less than f star minus r k. That's because of this uh, lemma, this proposition, right? Uh, because if uh, uh, this inequality holds, we should see a geometric reduction no more than this many iteration. But now we already passed this many iteration, but the reduction hasn't happened. That means uh, the initial solution is already good enough so that you can never see uh, this reduction again within this T iterations. So now we have a, a, we are now confident about our initial solution, Z star. We know that it is less than equal to F star minus RK. And then uh, we can return Z star as XK. Then we can proceed with our uh, level set method. So that's how error bound condition can be uh, can be useful because you, we can use that to establish this proposition one. However, that's the issue. Just as Yang Yang said, we do not know T because T involve M, G, and D and, and a lot of things. M may be something uh, argue, arguably computable 
but uh, G and D are usually unknown. And D may be also something you know, but G is unknown. So what can we do? So now this is like uh, the most important um, part of this talk. So we introduce something called a restarted level set master instead of just restarted uh, some gradient master. So uh, in order to better illustrate the idea, uh, I want to put this in a, con in a setting of a distributed computing. But my, my paper is not about distributed computing, uh, but this will help me to explain the algorithm. Actually, the algorithm can be implemented by just one machine. I suppose you have a K machine. You, the idea is that uh, you let different machine take a different level parameter R so that, uh, you solve, so that they can solve a different sub-problem defined by different R. So they minimize P with different RK. Okay, so here is the idea. We have an initialization stage. Uh, so I have to use a pseudo code to write it, to, to, to explain the algorithm because the formal algorithm in the paper is very complicated. Uh, by the way, the algorithm, the paper is already posted in, in archive. Um, so here we have an initialization stage. We let machine K choose any solution XK. Then we start a, a subgradient descent and machine K start the machine uh, uh, started at D zero K. Here I have a both a subscript and superscript. Sub, uh, superscript represent this Z is a sequence generated at machine K. Uh, uh, the subscripts zero represent the number of iteration in uh, a subgradient descent master um, uh, maintained uh, updated in machine K. So then. At the first step, once we get xk, I just make a, a crazy uh, assumption that this xk is already good enough. I know it can be wrong, but I just assume, pretend this xk is good enough. By good enough, I mean it satisfies the inequality here, which is needed for uh, doing level set master update. So I assume everything works, uh, even just random initial solution. Then let's run the level set update, just like in the algorithm, the level set algorithm. Now, the purpose of this initialization is to make sure every machine will receive a level parameter RK. Okay. And uh, all along it's generated by some bad quality, uh, XK of with a bad quality. So then we just run this K machine in parallel. They just, all this machine will run subgradient descent with this special step size. Okay. Then if one machine observes a reduction, the geometric reduction in the object value in their local sub problem, then this machine will update their solution. Will update their solution. Uh, so they will take the new solution as a better solution, override the existing XK. And so again, we pretend uh, the XK satisfies this inequality and run the, the level set update for all the machines, uh, um, for all the, mach all the machine after machine K, okay? Which means uh, K plus one, K plus two, up to K plus uh, K, capital K minus two, minus one. So we are going to do this sequential update, okay? And uh, this is exactly the level set update scheme. Then after this is updating of this R parameter from machine K to capital K minus two, like minus one, sorry. Then we are going to let those machine, those K minus, capital K minus little K machines um, to restart their sub, the sub, uh, sub gradient master at, with the new R, and the old, and the old Z, or uh, the old X. So be careful here, the machine only send R to the other machine, but they don't send XK to other machine. So the other machine, the receiver, will see a new R, but they can still use their previous XK as an initial solution. But uh, what happens is that if the, the uh, other machine are still in the middle of a subgradient descent master, and we have to completely abandon what has been generated in that subgradient, including the whole trajectory, okay? So, um, so here, basically, if, uh, then the question is that if we are lucky, actually XK has a high quality, which means it satisfy a listening quality. Then basically, we are just doing a, a level set master, right? And then, and then you just run level set master, we, and it's, it's done in one iteration, that's it. Um, but of course, we are not that lucky all the way. So we are going to have some pool, uh, solution of poor quality. Then listening quality will not be satisfied. Then we cannot use that convergence analysis of levels and master because that is uh, let's assume listening quality holds. So then RK, what happens is that uh, if you use this update, RK plus one will exceed F star. Well, you can check easily if you move uh, RK to the left hand side, then this RK plus one. 
by definition here, right? So land is bad because uh, we 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 uh, uh, well, basically what the, 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 the geometric intuitions I mentioned um, that is I described for the level set method will fail. Okay, um, but according to proposition one, it says if this inequality does not hold in the future, there will be a restart in machine K. Let's guarantee in proposition one. You see, so even though at this time, ten years ago, it will be corrected, and eventually it will become a good solution. So and this is also explain why we need to have a multiple machine because once a machine send a solution x r to the next machine, you don't know if this r is good or not. So what you can do is that I have to solve two machines just in case that the first machine will realize it sent the wrong solution and do the update and send the better solution to the next machine. But if it's actually sent, but if the first machine send the good solution to the second one, then we are not going to receive any new uh, input from the first machine, but the second machine will still need to, need to be uh, running. So that's why we have to keep solving, uh, we have to keep running um, those machines. And so on, and the number of machines will keep increasing. Uh, if you generalize this logic. Okay, so then here is the geometric literature to show you how this works. Suppose you have a first machine R0, it starts with the best solution. So alpha P is greater than F star minus R. And uh, the consequence is that uh, we don't know if it is greater than F star minus R or not because we don't know F star. We pretend it is a good, good, uh, good uh, uh, solution. So we update uh, R1. And then we move on, to, we get a solution here, which unfortunately, exceed F star. And this solution is basically useless, but we don't know, we still need to send it to machine one. Then machine one use this R1 to solve the, the sub problem, okay? Then we basically have two machines running and uh, they both, um, the objective value in both machine reduce. At some point, the first machine, uh, I mean the zero machine number zero, will have a high quality solution. So alpha P is now uh, lower than this uh, red line. Then if I do this again, then I'm going to get a solution, which is a, a R1 that is a, a to the left of F star. Okay, what happened is that I will basically waste my time in uh, solving the sub problem in machine one, because here the machine one is actually uh, uh, has, a, uh, has a bad level parameter R1. But anyway, this still helps. Eventually I will, we will correct our first. And similarly, if R1 has a bad solution, as above F star, machine R2 will know will, will, will not doing something. It's okay because R1 is doing something meaningful, and eventually R1 will get uh, overwrite uh, whatever uh, is generated in R2 and so on. We can still guarantee we have RK close enough to F star, and we are going to get epsilon optimal solution, epsilon feasible solution, epsilon RK is close to F star and also to the left of F star. Okay, so that's the idea. And uh, um, eventually we are going to have, let's say, number of out iterations we need just as the, the one machine level set master. So eventually, basically we need to have at least many uh, machine in order to support this analysis. Because if you, even, even if you know F star in run level set master, according to our theory at the very beginning, if you remember, this is the number of iteration levels that need to uh, implement. And uh, this is also how many level set parameter R1, R2 to RK they need to generate. Therefore, if we assume every machine use a level parameter, this will be the total number of the machine you need. But unfortunately, we don't know how to calculate this one so that we don't know how to prepare the right number of the machine beforehand. This quantity K hat in both theta, which is unknown. Say I remember, that's the left derivative, right? And F star is also unknown. So that's why we need to make another assumption, a strict feasibility assumption. We assume there exists X K hat that satisfies this inequality, okay? And X hat must be in a, a capital set, a, a X, the set capital X. All right, uh, with this uh, feasibility, uh, a strict, strict feasibility assumption, we can actually calculate an upper bound of a K hat. And this upper bound is K, even here, which is computable because R hat is defined by this one. And by the way, G is the, just the, the maximum of a constraint function. You can think about G as uh, uh, just 
constraint violation. And G is negative if X hat is, an, is a strictly feasible solution. And a, a theta hat is defined also by computable quantity. Okay, so if you put all of this together into a form like this, K is the upper bound of a K hat. And uh, then you just prepare the number of the machine according to this quantity K. And unfortunately, this quantity only depends on epsilon in the logarithmic way. So uh, it's not asking you to create a, whole, a, a lot of machine, you just need a, a small amount. So uh, then if you use this many machine to implement the idea I mentioned above, okay, um, actually in a restarted level set master, number of machines should be determined beforehand. So basically, if you use K to choose as a number of machine, here is the final result, the main complexity result in this talk. So we have a very complicated formula. So this is calculating how many gradients you need to calculate it in a whole system, not in one machine. That's why we, you can see there's a multiplier K here, okay? So this is the total number of the gradient you need to calculate in, 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 in every machine, in, in, in all, all number of the machines. And this is the order of magnitude if you only focus on the dependency. It's dependency on epsilon. Okay. Implemented by one machine, how do you do that? Actually, I, you just do a very naive implementation. You just run that first machine, run one iteration of a subgradient descent, and move on the second one. The second one run one iteration of SGD, and then move on to the next one, and do it in a circle. Once you finish the, the machine K, you go back to the first one. Okay, so that's how we implement this naively in uh, with one machine. And let's, but uh, all along is implemented in one machine, it still have this complexity because this complexity is not given as runtime, it's given as a number of subgradient you need to calculate. And I have, I have already uh, multiplied this by K. So this, uh, uh, and that's actually how I get this uh, uh, cube here in this logarithmic term. All right, so then let's talk about, uh, quickly talk about the smooth case. Um, the idea is very similar. The only difference is that we have to use a different algorithm to solve the uh, separate problem. The separate problem uh, is now solved by smoothing technique. This is the exponential smoothing uh, 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 idea. So if we assume all assumption in proposition two, like here, still holds, uh, not proposition two, sorry, proposition one, which means we still need uh, assumption one, which is capacity, assumption two, which is a uh, um, error bound condition. We also need a bounded, boundedness of the gradient. With this assumption, and in addition, we assume the alpha smooth and its gradient as L lips continue, then if you choose the smoothing parameter sigma in this way, then it has the same guarantee as in the non-smooth case. That means that if your initial solution is bad, then you are going to see a geometric reduction of the objective function in this many iterations. And here, again, to implement the algorithm, the step size is not a big deal because you, you know, if the function is smooth, you can do light search, right? Like the next of light search to search the, the, the step size that involve like Lipsis continuous quantity of the gradient. But here, another quantity you, the user need to, um, need to define is the smoothing parameter. Fortunately, definition of a smoothing parameter depends on no quantities. Here, M is the number of the constraint, which you should know. All right. So based on the same idea, we can let different machines to solve the sub problem using smoothing accelerated gradient master as a G. And uh, we end up with the following complexity. And uh, here, uh, the C or here is a say C or parameter I define in serum one, but eventually you get this complexity. The difference here is that with smoothness, the exponent here uh, is, is changed. It is now one minus one over D. In the non-smooth case, we have a two minus two over D, okay? So here is the summary of the result. Um, so here, um, this complexity again is given, uh, assuming RLS is implemented by one machine. So uh, if you ignore the polynomial of logarithmic term of the one over epsilon, just compare on the, uh, the sublinear part, and I think uh, it, it, in, uh, error bound condition also reduce the complexity of the, the first order approach. Uh, so here, for example, if D is one, just like uh, if you have a function that have a uh, piecewise linear objective function, piecewise linear constraint, um, that include machine learning problem with a hinge loss, for example, then uh, uh, this algorithm 
complexity. But if you don't use error bound condition, you are solving the problem as convex and with non-smooth constraint, your complexity will be one over epsilon squared, which is significantly worse than this complexity. Similarly, if you have a smoothness and you have constraint, the best known result it will be, um, let me see, yes, one over square root epsilon. But if you have, uh, um, let's say D is one, then you are going to have also logarithmic complexity. But even with is in the uh, strong capacity assumption, uh, so sorry, if you have something D less than not one, but between one and two, you still get something better than this result. Yeah, so here is some remark I want to say. Uh, this idea, as I said, is motivated by this multi-machine uh, approach. It's called the restarted and subgradient master invented by uh, Renegar and Grimer. But uh, I would say the, the, the biggest similarity is using multiple machine, but uh, the detail is very different. First of all, they consider, they consider unconstrained problem under error bound condition, but we consider a constraint problem under error bound condition, which is a very different problem. And uh, uh, second, uh, in their idea, they use the machine K to run SGD to solve an unconstrained sub problem with a different special step size. And then re they restart the SGD master if the object function is reduced by uh, this quantity. So in their case, their machine, different machines are using different step size. First machine uses a large step size, second machine with a, a step size that's only half of the first machine, and so on. And in my case, uh, uh, we don't focus on the different step size instead of different level parameter RK. So this is the difference. And so, uh, each machine, uh, in their case, once the machine gets rest uh, restarted, they, this machine will only send XK, the solution, to the next machine. But in our case, the machine will send level parameter, not the solution. And it is not sent just to the next machine, it's sent to the old machine to its right. So K is sent to K plus one, K plus two, and K plus three, and so on. Okay, so I believe there is some like fundamental connection between these two ideas, um, but uh, I, I haven't figured out any, I don't have a very good explanation yet. And uh, last but not least, uh, uh, this uh, uh, a restarted level set master is a fully adaptive master. If you look at our uh, algorithm, what we need is to calculate either the step size, uh, where's that here? This step size for the non-smooth case, or calculate the smoothing parameter here in a in a smooth case. So none of the, both of these can be calculated easily. We don't need to know uh, step uh, the grade if it's constant. We don't need to know the, the domain the diameter of the domain. We don't need to know strong capacity parameter. We don't need to know g. We don't need to know d. Okay, so that's a fully adaptive. Some algorithm in the existing literature uh, will require knowing some of these quantity. Okay, so uh, I think that's the, uh, uh, my talk, and here is just a quick summary. Um, here is the, the takeaway. Uh, without error bound condition, uh, I think uh, mm, the complexity of level semester has already matched the best result in literature. And according to the existing complexity result, uh, those results without error bound condition cannot be further improved in general. But error bound condition actually uh, holds for many existing practical real world problems. Um, so why don't we study that to see uh, how we can get benefit from it. So with error bound condition, the complexity of the level set master can be reduced further, but you will need to know um, some problem dependent parameters, right? And uh, uh, this is actually the same issue uh, in the existing um, um, literature. For example, uh, I have the uh, uh, already a penalty master, they can utilize error bound condition. But in that paper, I require knowing G and D. And, then, and the, so that you cannot just directly apply error bound condition and now it's a standard level set master. So that's why we need to introduce ILS so that we can avoid um, the dependency, or to avoid the requirement of knowing this D and G, this unknown problem, uh, problem dependent parameter. And uh, uh, we get some, uh, of course, the, the, the cost is that we uh, turn log one over epsilon turn in our complexity. Um, but, uh, we, uh, we, uh, but I think it's worth to do it because you have the, the complexity now that is uh, better than the existing result and you do not need to know 
uh, this problem dependent parameter. Actually, this is the first uh, uh, adaptive algorithm in the literature that accelerate first order master in um, uh, under error bound condition. Okay, so that's all of my talk and thank you very much for attending. Um, questions and comments are welcome.